once again. And uh, this morning we're going to conclude our short series of messages on spiritual health. And uh, based on this passage, beginning in verse 6, 1 Timothy 4, 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now this is personal. He said, you're nourished up uh, in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou, personal, singular, thou hast attained. He said, exercise thyself unto godliness. We all have this personal responsibility toward the Word of God. He said, but for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. And uh, as you labor to serve the Lord and you live a godly life, don't expect everybody to appreciate it. There's going to be reproach there. We suffer reproach. But we, we do it, he said, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Let's pray once again. Father, help us now this morning as we talk again about the importance of spiritual health. Uh, Lord, help us to uh, take these things to heart from the Word of God. And I pray the Holy Spirit would make these truths very real to us and we, we would receive uh, this truth, and may it work in us and through us for your honor and glory, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So just as in the physical realm, to be spiritually healthy, we must balance proper diet and exercise. You've got to take the right stuff in, and then you've got to do something with it. You've you got to work it out. And we need to do that on a, on a consistent basis, not once a week <laughs> uh, or every once in a while, but daily. Now, those who are not spiritually healthy do not have the strength to withstand the deception and apostasy that abounds today. That's how the chapter opens. 1 Timothy 4 opens with a warning about apostasy, doctrines of devils. And if you're not rooted and grounded in the truth, if you're not spiritually healthy, you'll get sucked into that mystery of iniquity. You'll get led astray. Now, if you're saved, you're saved. You can't lose it. But a saved person can get deceived and get off track and get messed up in this life. And so a good minister, according to the scriptures, is one that warns people about apostasy and about the danger of being deceived. Paul, he deals with it all through his epistles. And he warns us of, of that danger. And yet we live in a time now where very few ministers are sounding any warning at all. Uh, they just want to be positive. They want to accentuate the positive. But there's negative things we've got to deal with. And that's what a good minister will do according to this passage. Now I remind you again that as to our standing, that is our unchangeable position in Christ Jesus, who we are in Him. All believers are complete in Christ the very moment we trust Christ is saved. You can't get any more saved than you are the moment you believe. But as to our state, that's that changeable condition in this life. We may be weak or even dead. In this very epistle, Paul talks about those who live in pleasure being dead while they yet liveth. <laughs> and he's talking about believers in the context. Uh, your standing is you're alive in Christ, but in your state, you may act like you're still dead. Your standing is you're in the light, but your state may be like you're still in darkness. Your standing is you're healthy in the Lord, uh, but your state may be that you're weak and sickly. And so the goal in spiritual growth is getting our state state lined up more and more with our standing. It will not apprehend in this life. It's a growth process, but we need to continually be pressing toward the mark, and that mark is who we are in Christ, being conformed to His image, which will ultimately take place when we meet the Lord in the air, and we get that new and glorified body fashioned like unto His. 
But the sad reality is uh, most professing Christians will stay on a milk diet all their life and never really grow to the spiritual maturity to handle the meat of the Word. You start with the milk, but as you get nourished in the milk, you ought to be able to handle the meat. And I was talking about that passage earlier in John 6. When Jesus said some meaty things, and they, they quit following Him. They couldn't handle it. Uh, they couldn't handle that meat that He spoke of. And, um, you know, we need to be able to, yes, we start out with those simple things, the milk of the Word, but we need to be able to grow to where we can handle the meat of the Word. And like I said last time, that is not just an issue of what we know. It's an issue of what we do with what we know. Uh, you can study 1 Corinthians 3 on that. Where Paul talked about the meat of the word. He talked about how they were carnal and not spiritual because they walked just like men, just like lost men with their envying and their strife and their divisions and so forth. And uh, so that's kind of just bringing you up to speed a little bit where we left off last time in our last message. We, we really put the emphasis on the importance of spiritual nourishment. Well, uh, the whole Bible is the word of God. And, uh, and as we study the whole Bible, there, there's nourishment there. Uh, it's the words of life. It's the words of God. We, it's the food of the new nature, the food of the new man. Uh, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. I perceive thou the mouth of God. So I believe we ought to feed on the whole word, study the whole book. But, you know, if you're going to get the nourishment out of the word of God that God intends for us to get, wouldn't it make sense that we study it his way? So it's not enough just to get in the Bible. You've got to learn to study the Bible God's way because if you don't, you can actually hurt yourself with the Word of God, which is not God's fault or the Bible's fault. It's our fault if we don't study the Bible God's way. God said all Scripture is profitable in 2 Timothy 3, but He also said you must rightly divide it in 2 Timothy 2. And see what happens is in this context, for an example, in verse 3, it talks about these doctrines of devils, and he gives the example of forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. I could take you back in the law and show you some commandments about God's people not being able to marry certain people. There was some restrictions, and uh, of course there's still principles today we can apply. But my point is there are some verses in the law about that, and especially talking about the dietary law, God said they had to abstain from certain meats. To be right with Him, they had to follow what He said. It wasn't an option. But to say in this age of grace that you have to abstain from meats to be right with God is now a doctrine of devils because that's not what God is doing today. So the devil, if he can't get you to deny the Word of God in general, he'll just try to confuse you with it in particular, taking things out of context. And if you fail to rightly divide the Word of Truth, you will be ashamed in how you serve, the God, in how you serve God in this life, but especially at the judgment seat of Christ when we give an account of our service. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're not going to get the nourishment necessary for effectual Christian service if you fail to rightly divide the word of truth. That's how you get the most profit out of it. There's profit in the word of God. But to get that spiritual profit out of it, it must be studied God's way. So when he says, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Okay, if you tell somebody they have to keep the Sabbath holy to be right with God, that's in the Bible, but that's not good doctrine for the age of grace. You're not rightly dividing the word of truth. So bad doctrines when you make stuff up, <laughs> but it's also when you take things out of context. It's biblical, but is it dispensational? Saying that you must speak with an unknown tongue today if you're filled with the Holy Spirit is not good doctrine. It's doctrine in the Bible, but it's not good doctrine for the age of grace. For the Scripture says plainly that the gift of tongues has ceased. All those signed gifts have ceased. And, and so I'm just giving you examples of how it's not enough to say, well, I, I feed in the Word of God, I get in the Word of God every day. That's a starting point. That's not a stopping point. You've got to get in the Word of God and be sure you study it God's way or you can get messed up in your doctrine. The words of faith and of good doctrine. All doctrine is not good doctrine. 
There is false doctrine. There is doctrine of devils. Okay? You need good doctrine, sound doctrine, the nourishment, he said, of faith and of good doctrine. Now, in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, he said in verse 9 about the deacon, uh, one of the requirements or qualifications, if a man's going to hold the office uh, and use the office of a deacon in the church, it says, holding, verse 9, 1 Timothy 3, verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The mystery of the faith. There, there is mysteries that was revealed through the Apostle Paul for this age, and we are to be stewards of the mysteries of God. So it's not just the faith as in the whole Bible in general, but in particular, the mystery of the faith. Uh, the church, the body of Christ, and what it means to be in Him in those doctrines and mysteries that uh, go along with that. So, in other words, where, where are we living in particular in God's plan for the ages? It's not enough just to be general about it. Yes, believe the whole Bible, but then study it God's way and know where you're at in particular and what God is doing today because He does change in His dealings with man through the ages. He doesn't change, but His dealings with man has changed as He's revealed more truth. And we need to know in particular what dispensation we're living in. And um, so, go back, uh, and always keep a marker, please, in uh, 1 Timothy 4. But look back in Colossians 2. That word nourished. He's writing to correct bad doctrine in Colossians that detracted from the supremacy and all sufficiency of Jesus Christ as the head of the body of Christ. And he said, you're complete in Him in this context. And uh, don't think you need to uh, do these religious ordinances and um, these mystical type things they were getting into. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff that was detracting and he's correcting that and saying, look, you're, it's all about him, the head of the body. I don't have time to fully develop the context, but I want to jump in at verse number 19 and point out what it says here. Not holding the head. That'd be the Lord Jesus Christ. Not putting your trust in him and giving him the honor that's due him as the head of the body, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. He builds his body. Okay? And the nourishment comes from the head. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to be nourished up in the, the, the truth of who you are in Him as a member of His body. Okay, you're not a branch and a vine. Okay, I, I know that's in the Bible in John 15. But if you study what it says in John 15 and compare it with what Paul wrote to the body of Christ, there's some differences there. Being a branch in the vine is one thing. Being a member of His body is another. God will take a branch off a vine, but He's not going to cut His arm off. Okay, you got a better position as a member of the body. The sad reality is most professing Christians, they just don't have that confidence of who they are in Christ because they're never taught that. They don't know they're complete in Him. They don't know they're already accepted in the Beloved. Religion's telling them they have to perform. And they have to do this and do that and earn God's favor and all of that. That's bad doctrine. Anybody that's telling you you've got to perform certain things to be right with God is teaching you bad doctrine. And I've had people even here recently get upset with me on this issue that I teach all your sins are forgiven the moment you believe. You can't get any more right with God than you are the moment you believe. But people want to come and add religion to that and say, no, you've got to do certain things to keep yourself in fellowship. And you've got to perform. That is legalism and bad doctrine. And so we're just going to, by the grace of God, keep standing for who we are in Christ. We're not under the law. We're under grace. But man, that's not a pot. You'd think that'd be a wonderful thing people would love and rejoice in. But you get a lot of opposition if you take that stand. But man, I'm telling you, hey, isn't it wonderful to know that you, we have it all in Christ and we receive that nourishment from that truth that, of, of who we are in Him and, you know, that corresponds, well, let's go over to Ephesians 4. This is what real ministry does. Ephesians 4, verse number, 
12, the Lord ascended up far above all heavens, and from that position He gave uh, apostles, prophets, and of course there's no longer any need for those offices, but He also mentions evangelists and pastors and teachers. Now what's the point of the ministry? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now as the saints get perfected in the faith, they're going to do the work of the ministry, which will result in the edifying of the body of Christ. All the nourishment comes from the head, but it works through the members. It's not just the pastor's job to edify people. Every member of the body of Christ should be edifying one another. And he said, till we all come in the unity of the faith, well, we're not going to apprehend that, so it's a, it's a continual process in this life. Um, we'll apprehend that when the Lord comes. But till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Paul's always talking about the danger of bad doctrine because it's so rampant. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. If you're in the body of Christ, God has a purpose for you. There's something, there's a role to fill. Every member is important. Uh, you know, you may think your pinky toe is not a big deal, but just go ahead and cut it off and see what happens. Okay? And it doesn't matter if you're the pinky toe or the eye in the body of Christ. Every member is important. Okay? And he said... That the, the, the compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. See, you notice the emphasis? Every part of the body. Maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself. The body is to be edifying itself in love. But it all comes from the head. Knowing who you are in Him and that truth working through the members of his body. So we need to be nourished up in the words of faith, in particular the mystery of the faith, which is the body of Christ and good doctrine. Um, hey, look back in 1 Timothy. Good doctrine. You know, <clears throat> back in time past when Israel was under the law and that's what God was doing, that was good doctrine. But you bring the body of Christ under the law today, that's not good doctrine. I didn't say that. Obviously, there are moral principles in the law that still apply. We understand that. But there's a big difference between law and grace. Okay? And Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, in verse number 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, thou mightest charge some, they teach no other doctrine. Well, he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me... The same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, you know my doctrine. You see? So in other words, the doctrine is what Paul gave him and Paul got it from Jesus Christ. Alright? He said, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And if you follow this context, it's clear these were people who were trying to go back to the law because he says in verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And that's why, look, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, so I'm talking about this good doctrine. The good doctrine is you're in the body of Christ under grace. It's not just the whole doctrine of the Bible. I mean, the whole Bible is the Word of God. But if you don't rightly divide it, you can teach bad doctrine. You see what I'm saying? All right, 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, 
Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Paul said, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. The sound words are wholesome words. Whose words are they? Jesus Christ. Paul talking about what he wrote in this epistle, and he calls it the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. You can't produce godliness by putting people back under the law because the strength of sin is the law. The law is holy, but it can't make people holy. It's like a mirror. Tell you got dirt on your face, but it won't wipe your face for you. Okay? It's in the body of Christ you can be made godly. And that doctrine is according to godliness. Um, again, there was nothing wrong with the law. It was the flesh of man unable to perform under that system. So God brought us under something much better. He brought us under grace, not to eliminate righteousness, but to enable it through us by Jesus Christ. And so, the good doctrine. we gotta, we got to be nourished up in the Word of God not just in general, in particular, you get the most nourishment out of the Word of God when you study it God's way. And as you study it God's way, and you know what sound doctrine is, then you've got to start refusing all the junk food out there. Okay? The junk food of false doctrine. Hey, there's some appealing... There's, a, there's things about false doctrine, obviously, that's appealing to the flesh. That's why most people sop it up like they do. And, um, you know, this false doctrine that abounds, we got to refuse it. We, there are doctrines of devils. we got to refuse. Paul talked a lot about fables, these, these religious stories. It's unscriptural. It's not right. And, and, and he talked about the Jewish fables. And I don't have time to run all those references. He brought it up quite a bit. You ought to track that down and study that out. But he said you got to refuse that stuff. And he talked about refusing, uh, he said, beware, beware. And it, notice, by the way, whenever Paul sounds that warning, and it's, he doesn't do it all the time, he does it rarely. When he does, what is he talking about? Is he talking about, you know, watching movies? He said, no, beware of philosophy, vain deceit. It's after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. When he sounds the warnings and he says, beware, it's always got to do with bad doctrine. You know, it's so dangerous. People don't take that danger seriously, though. Beware, Colossians 2. He said, they're going to spoil you. You won't be able to enjoy who you are in Christ if you get spoiled from knowing what that is because of that bad doctrine you're listening to. Reject it. Refuse it. That's what he said in 1 Timothy 4. It's not just an issue of being nourished up. It's refusing. Refuse the profane. It's unholy because it's not sound doctrine in the Holy Bible. Old wives' fables. And uh, he talked about Jewish fables. He talked about, again, I'm not going to run those references for time, but you can. that's a little homework for you. Check those references. But old wives' fables, by the way... Um, Ellen G. White, I mean, uh, it's in this very passage, it talks about commanding to abstain from meats and so on. And Seventh-day Adventism, they put people back under the law uh, about the Sabbath and the dietary law and all that. Isn't that interesting? Think God knew Ellen G. White was going to come along with her old wives' fables? Right. Okay, refuse it. Refuse it. And... You know, the core, I think we've looked, I'm sure we've looked at this passage already in this series, but a corresponding passage is 2 Timothy 2 when he said in verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun. <laughs> Talk about a strong word. Profane and vain babblings. Anybody that's teaching doctrine that's not rightly divided, it's not sound doctrine, they're, it's just vain babblings. It's not going to do you any good at all. In fact, it'll hurt you. He said, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral ground. There's no vacuum you can get into. You either got the right doctrine producing godliness or false doctrine producing ungodliness. And their word will he doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. 
And um, who concerning the truth of erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. They were not denying the truth of resurrection. They weren't rightly dividing, putting the resurrection in the wrong place. See, again, right, the whole Bible is a word of truth, but it must be rightly divided. There are differences that must stay within context in order to be understanding the doctrine. And, and man... All the false teachers out there have verses for what they're saying. And the root of it all is not rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we, we have to study, but we also have to shun, okay? And Paul likens false doctrine to being profanity and blasphemy. So these guys that get up with their big smile and they're so sweet and all that, if they're teaching false doctrine, they're profaning and blaspheming. Well, this is what the Word of God says. And that's not to be taken lightly. In fact, Paul said, deliver them unto Satan so they might learn something about that. Very serious stuff. Now, all right. That was all introduction and review. <laughs> But being nourished up in the good doctrine, if we get that, we, we then have the strength to exercise in godliness. If you know anything about physical exercise, it's very difficult to do it if you don't get nourished. It's very difficult to maintain a high level of exercise if you're not uh, properly nourished. And so it goes together. Once you get that proper nourishment, now... You could exercise in godliness. Now, what does it mean to be godly? Uh, Webster's 1828. Now, that's typically a good dictionary, but it's not the best dictionary. The best dictionary is the King James Bible. Study words in the Bible. It defines its own words. You know what Webster says about godliness? It's a religious life. That's ungodliness today. Yeah. Religion was something God used in the past. It's something He'll use again in the future, but it's not something He's using now. Paul only mentioned religion a few times and it was always bad. <laughs> he talked about what He was before He was saved. So no, it's not a religious life. Some of the most ungodly people in this world are religious. Right? There are leaders of religion that are as ungodly as the devil. Just because they're religious doesn't make them godly? No, you know what godliness is? Look at the word. Godliness. God-likeness. Now, there's only one true God, but He lives in us, and He wants to live His life through us. Godliness is God's life in you. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Christ liveth in me. That's godliness. I mean, the main point that Paul is making in the context is that true godliness... And by the way, he refers to godliness ten times in 1 Timothy. Okay? True godliness is produced by our spiritual union with Christ, not by the religious exercise of your flesh. I remind you again that the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3, 14, these things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself. And that's to be godly. In the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, what is the truth in particular he speaks of? Here it is. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, as we've already shown you, he's talking about the church in, the, in verse 16. Yes, he's talking about Jesus Christ, but he's not just talking about Jesus Christ personally. He's talking about Jesus Christ and his church, that we are one together. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That applies to both Jesus Christ personally and in his church. Christ and His church are one. It's not just talking about Jesus Christ personally, because if that were the case, this is out of order in the way it's mentioned. He's talking about the church. That's what He said in verse 15. <laughs> and the, the fact that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh was not a mystery. 
That was prophesied. The body of Christ is the mystery. The mystery of godliness is that sinners like us are made godly by our union with Christ. Christ was baptized into our humanity that we might be baptized into His body. Okay? And so we have this union with Him. Now, that's the mystery of godliness. That's what God is doing. But what is the devil doing? Chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, the faith He just mentioned, the body of Christ. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. What is denominationalism but an absolute rejection of the truth of the body of Christ? Right? Isn't that what it is? They deny the one body. They, they set up their own system. And every denomination was started by a man. Every single one of them. And it flies in the face of what God is building. You say, what denomination is God building? Not a single cotton picking one of them. Not a one of them. He's building the body of Christ. That's what God is doing. And so people, they split up into their little splinters and groups and isms and schisms and they have all these variations where they deny those seven ones of Ephesians 4, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And they bring in all this stuff. And it always comes down to issues of the flesh. I mean, how were you water baptized, my brother? If it wasn't the way we do it, then you cannot be a member of our denomination. Yeah. Well, I don't want to be a member of your denomination. I want to be a member of Christ. Okay, you can keep your denomination. But that's what it is. All the denominations are marked, they are distinguished by fleshly things. Alright, so the mystery of iniquity is what Paul gets into in the beginning of chapter 4. It's religion. The mystery of iniquity is iniquity in the form of religion. And so these are conflicting. And you have the mystery of godliness versus the mystery of iniquity, and yet most people think they're godly because of something they've done in their flesh. You can only be godly because of who you are in Christ. And so it's not enough to learn the truth. That's where it starts. That's not where it should stop. We must live by the truth we learn. Paul's epistles are perfectly balanced with the practical application of sound doctrine. He always starts with sound doctrine, and then he says this is how you ought to walk in light of that. He does it again and again and again. He never starts with application. He always starts with doctrine, and then he shows the proper application of that doctrine all through his epistles. Look please in Ephesians 4. This is so crucial. Ephesians chapter 4. Alright, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. There's the doctrine of the church, the body of Christ. Alright, now notice how 4, 5, and 6 emphasize our walk. But let's just read some in chapter 4 here, verse 1. I therefore, okay, on the basis of this doctrine, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. That vocation has to do with our calling as a member of the body of Christ. With all lowliness and meekness. With long suffering, forbearing one another in love. We're not members of the body because we're so great. We're members of His body by grace. That ought to humble us. Okay, we don't deserve this. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. If this, what God, if this is what God is doing, and He is, don't you think that's what the devil's attacking? And it's so ironic that the people who know the most about this doctrine, at times we can practice it very poorly. In that I think that the devil especially attacks the unity of the Spirit in a church that stands for the doctrine of the one body. They call it the grace movement that understands Paul was given these revelations. And in the greater, broader scope of the grace movement, it's so full of divisions, it's almost as bad as denominationalism. And that's, that's, that's sad, is it not? Well, I, I'm not responsible for the grace movement, and I'm not in it, by the way. I don't want to be in anybody's movement. I want to be, all I care about is being in the body of Christ and pastoring a local church. Okay? All that other stuff is none of my... Uh, give, everybody will give an account to the Lord. Not going to give an account. It's not my job to straighten out the grace movement and whatever. Okay? 
But what I'm saying is in our local church, we can endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. And if you've got to endeavor to keep it, doesn't mean it comes natural and easy, does it? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now here is how we have fellowship, okay? You will notice that your preferences and opinions and ideas are nowhere in the passage. Okay, but here's the basis of fellowship. There is one body and one Spirit. This is a statement of fact. It's the way it is. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and obviously these are spiritual things, only being baptized by one spirit and one body. Can that, can, that's the only thing he could be talking about when he says one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. See? But denominationalism attacks this, doesn't it? And, uh, and now look, when I say, look, I'm not talking about let's be ecumenical and forget doctrine. No. Let's hold to the sound doctrine. If people don't want to hold to that, then, we, then there is a time for proper separation from false doctrine. But what I'm saying is we should never be a part of something that's contrary to what God is doing. And if you're a part of a church that says we will not accept you as a part of our church without water baptism, you're in the wrong place. Because that is not what God is doing. And the only way people could teach that is to not rightly divide the word of truth. That's the only way they could teach that. And so we understand that, look, all right, we saw it in our scripture reading in Philippians 2. Uh, you know what he said? Let's look over there again. We won't read the whole chapter again, but I want to read a couple verses out of that chapter. Uh, Philippians 2. Verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, wherefore, on the basis of what he just said in, in verses 1 through 11, and you talk, he talks about the mind of Christ. Well, we're, the nourishment comes from the head of the body. We have the mind of... How, did, how are we to treat one another? Study what it is to have the mind of Christ on these things. That's what he's dealing with in the passage. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Exercise thyself unto godliness. You can't work for salvation. You're saved by grace. But once you have it, you have your own salvation, so you're saved. Now work out what God's worked in. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure." Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That, that flies in the face of who you are in the body of Christ. He talked about the beginning of the chapter being like-minded, same love, one accord, one mind, nothing done through strife, nothing through vainglory, that murmurings and disputings. That's all flesh. That's not the mind of Christ. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Boy, we live in a dark world. You talk about strife. And yet the church, if it's full of strife, how can we be a light to the world? We've got to work out our own salvation. We've got to exercise ourselves in godliness. You know what that means? Being able to get along with other believers like we actually are members of the same body. Okay? That's what he's talking about in particular. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now we can't make the unity. God makes it. But we've got to keep it in how we practice it. And how we walk. You know what Paul likens the Christian life to? A walk. Now, that's exercise. Okay? A run. A work to do. And a fight. Those are words that require movement and doing something. This is exercise. Exercising in Godless. What I'm saying is this. It's one thing to know about the mystery of the one body. It's something else to treat other believers like they are members of the same body you are. Um, somebody asked me recently about joining the church, and I said, we don't require more of people than God does. But churches do that. They say, oh, you might be saved, but unless you do this and this, you can't join. No, if you're in the body of Christ, then you ought to be able to assemble together with other believers and be welcome in that and accept one another in that. And learn how to see one another. Paul said, we don't know one another as flesh anymore. But we're a new creature. And we, we have that fellowship. In fact, Paul said that I, that I make 
that I might make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning hath been hid in God, but is now revealed. How are men going to see the fellowship of the mystery? How are men... I didn't say, he didn't say hear. Make all men see. A local church in a community that holds to the doctrine of the one body and then demonstrates it day in and day out and how they treat one another is a light to that community of the fellowship of the mystery. People need to see it. You understand when we say one thing, we talk about this doctrine and then we act another way, people are like, I'm not interested in that hypocrisy. We hinder the ministry like that. You know, there are churches that act like, well, we got the right doctrine, period. That's all that matters. No, that's what matters most. That's where it starts. But if you don't demonstrate the doctrine as the pillar and ground of the truth, it's a hindrance. There are too many Dead Sea Christians. You know what the Dead Sea does, don't you? It takes in and never gives out. They take in, they'll take in the right doctrine, and they never demonstrate it or extend it. We talk so much about the grace of God, and then we treat people based on their performance. I'll accept you if you live up to the way I want you to perform. That's not grace, right? We're all guilty of it. I'm just saying we got to acknowledge that and realize, hey, uh, it's not enough just to to take in the right doctrine, we need to do something with it. And we've taken in this amazing grace and long-suffering and mercy. We need to be a channel of that, not a sponge. When something takes in and never gives out, it dies. Someone said this, Doctrine without godliness is like a tree without fruit. But if you just have a form of godliness without doctrine, it's like a tree without roots. You see how you need both? In other words, you have a form, but you don't have the right doctrine. There's no root there. But if you say you have the right doctrine, but there's no fruit, that's a problem also. And if there's anybody in the Bible that's clear about the importance of good works, it's the Apostle Paul. Which I find kind of strange that there's so many people saying they follow Paul and they act like if you bring up good works, you're a legalist. They're, they're extreme. They're out of balance. They want to talk about being nourished up, but they don't want to exercise. You go home today. Here's some more homework. And look up everything Paul said about good works. And you'll find there's quite the emphasis. The man who said you're not saved by works said you ought to do good works if you're saved. Right? Again and again he does that. In fact, Titus where he says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. It's in that very epistle. The whole theme is good works. He talks about it again and again through those three chapters in Titus. For by grace are you saved. You know the passage, Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For <laughs> we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, it's a process. Look, none of us have, I, I haven't arrived, you haven't arrived, but let's acknowledge we need this balance. Okay? I started out this series talking about how people focus on one over the other. Some it's all application, no doctrine. Others it's all doctrine, no application. Both are needed. In spiritual health. Now he talked about bodily, and we're going to bring this to a close. Let me just say a word on this because, uh, you know, 1 Timothy 4 and verse number uh, 8 is not an excuse for you to stay out of the gym. I just want to make that clear. Bodily exercise profit is little. <laughs> but he's not talking about going to the gym and whatever. or What he's talking about is religion. Because he said in verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. In other words, you might try to keep the dietary law. That might make you more healthy, but it's not going to make you holy. What you do in your flesh profiteth little. In fact, Jesus said it profiteth nothing. 
He's saying it profits little in comparison. That's a way you can say it. Another way you could say it is what Christ said when he said it profits. What, what the flesh profiteth nothing. The bodily exercise, you know what that is? That's what's going on in churches all across the world right now. They took their body to a building. They sat that body in a, in a pew. And they think they're godly. You know what? There are many professing Christians who are not enjoying the Christian life because they're on the treadmill of religion. You know what a treadmill does? You get on a treadmill and you go and go and go and go. But when you get off, you didn't go anywhere. You know what, the, you know what churches are doing? It's nothing but activity. They're trying to drown out the fact they don't know the truth. They're just trying to stay busy, thinking if they're busy, they're automatically right with God. Well, we're busy. We're, we're, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that. Every night of the week, they got something you can do. Do this, do this, do that. A lot of activity. And they think there are churches, and I've been in churches like this. They think you're right. As long as you, if you go to church faithfully, and you tithe, and you knock on doors, that's all, that's it. That's the Christian life. And I've seen people drop out of that because it's not fulfilling. They're doing it in the energy of the flesh, and they get burnt out. I've come across people... You know, in the past when I was in a church like that, I'd meet them all the time out on visitation. They're just, you wouldn't tell any difference between them and the world. They've dropped out. They said, yeah, I used to have a bus route down there. <laughs> and, I don't, and now they don't want, they want to come to church. They're sick of it. They're burnt out. And that's what legalism will do. It'll burn you out. It's your flesh trying to perform. And it just won't last. In 2 Timothy 3, he talked about the last days. And he, and he talked about all these sins but he said it in the context of all the while these people will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And what you have, the mystery of iniquity is having a form of godliness but denying the power of godliness. The power of godliness is who you are in the body of Christ and that doctrine being in you and working through you, God living his life through you. Activity does not equal godliness. Your flesh cannot be like Jesus. That's what I was taught. Okay, you got saved. Now you got to train your flesh to be like Christ. I found that to be an exercise in futility. You can't make your flesh like Christ. Oh, what a wonderful day it was when I learned Christ liveth in me. And now I just need to let Him live His life through me. I just need to believe and yield and submit and walk in the Spirit through the Word of God, Christ, His life through me. And so it's not about the mere activity. It's about the doctrine producing the godliness. It's a relationship with God, a real spiritual living union, not just going through the motions of the flesh. Well, you live godly in Christ. The promise is all that live godly in Christ, Jesus shall suffer persecution. <laughs> flesh gets offended by teaching like this. The flesh wants to perform. Well... Paul said, if you live godly, it has promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In chapter 6, I close my Bible, but I'm going to keep talking about it. In 1 Timothy 6, he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. You brought nothing to this world. You can take nothing out. The love of money is the root of all evil. You can live a wonderful life even if you're poor, if you're godly and content. And then he said, you need to be rich in good works. Laying up a foundation against the time to come. In other words, at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll be rewarded. It's profitable for now and for eternity. And that being the case, you ought to be willing to suffer reproach. If you live godly, don't expect everybody to pat you on the back and, and think you're wonderful. All, all that really should care, uh, you should care about is pleasing the Lord who died for you. And glorifying Him and serving Him. And He will reward you. And it was all in His strength and for His glory. But we'll be rewarded for living a godly life. It's fulfilling now. It's rewarding in eternity. And so, are you really healthy? Personally, where are you at? Are you getting nourished up? And what are you doing with what you're taking in? Are you giving it out? Let's stand together, please.